Hello class, this is ESC 5250, sections 1 and 60, week 11, fall 2023. Recall last week we were looking at the trapezoid rule as a program. Now this program is available on Canvas for you to play with. And I would also advise you to modify the program because One of the things we added to that program was this get input function. How do we make it so that the user can enter their own values into this trapezoid rule program? So that's the main modification that we made here. So for this week, we are looking at a few things to consider regarding how do all of these processes send their values to one single process. So let's look at that right now. Our trapezoidal rule program works in the following way. We have a bunch of trapezoids divided among multiple processes. Each process calculates a local area that is the sum of its portion of the trapezoids. So each process will create, no, each process will calculate a local area, but we need the total area that is the sum of all of those local areas. So one process, usually process zero, is given the task of receiving the local areas from all other processes and then adding them up into one total area. How we have it set up in the code looks like this. Here's the code that does the receive a message from all other processes and then add those incoming local areas into a total. Check this out. We have a for loop as part of a if else code block here, where in the for loop, the task of adding all the areas falls on to process zero. So it's going to receive an area from process one, process two, process three, process a billion. Maybe not a billion, but maybe we could be adding values from a lot of processes. So maybe let's consider that extreme example of what happens if there are a billion processes and they all need to communicate with one process? Well, now, process zero has the big task of adding one billion values together. One by one, too. So, the next section talks about, hey, there are ways where we can make this addition a bit more efficient. The examples here are on the smaller scale, but the point of MPI code is that it's scalable. We can run it with as many processes as we want on as powerful hardware as we can find. So let's check out the setup of not having all the processes dump their values onto process zero, but rather, what if the processes coordinated with each other and pre-added some of these values. Let's look at that. This is a setup where the values are added in a binary tree. So let's say in our example of the trapezoid rule, we are calculating the area under a curve. This is a really funky curve, so parts of the areas are negative. And that task of finding the area is divided by, uh, divided among eight processes. So they each have their own local areas, 5, 2, negative 1, negative 3, 6, 5, negative 7, and negative 2. How we wrote it in the example program, we basically have processes 1 through 7 sending all of their values to process 0. We want this, we want instead to have all of these processes add their values in a tree structure. So check it out. Z process 0 is going to receive a message from process 1. 
process 1 is going to send a message to process 0. Process 0 will then contain the total that is the sum of those two processes' values. Processes 2 and 3 do the same thing. Processes 4 and 5 do the same thing. Processes 6 and 7 do the same thing. So, in that step, we, in a perfect world, we could imagine doing all of these additions concurrently. So, you can imagine we did 1, 2, 3, 4 additions, possibly all at the same time. And now, we have not 8 values to add, but 4 values to add. So now we have to add them pair by pair. So process 0 and process 2 now add their values together. Processes 4 and 6 add their values together. We did two additions at the same time, in theory. Now we have two more values to add. Process 0 and process 4 add their values together. And process 0 now has that new value. That total area is now 9. <clears throat> it is the same amount of work as if process 0 were to receive all the messages from processes 1 to 7 and then add all those local areas together into one value. The key difference is we're doing the same amount of work in less time. Consider another example where we had one 1,024 values together to be added into one total. If process 0 had to add values incoming from processes 1 to 1,023, and keep in mind that process 0 has its own local area as well, that is 1,023 additions to do. That's a lot. But, all these values can be added together in a tree structure with 1024 processes, each one having one value. So, the first step has pairs of processes 0 and 1, add their values together, and process 0 store, stores that value. Processes 2 and 3 add their values together. Processes 4 and 5 add their values together, all the way to processes 1022 and 1023. 512 additions happening all at once. So that's nearly half the work already done. Just doing that alone, we've cut the amount of time. Just doing that alone, we've did half of all the needed additions in one step, in theory at least. In practice, all of these processes might be working on their own uh, pace. So it might not necessarily be all processes start at the same time and then all processes end, end, end at the same time. There might be some variance with how fast each process accomplishes their goal of addition, but the point is we're still doing 512 additions in roughly the amount of time it takes to do one addition. The next step has us add pairs of processes, but their ranks. In the first step, we added values between processes whose ranks were separated by 1. So 0 and 1, 2 and 3, 4 and 5, 6 and 7. The next step has us doing the same thing, except the gap between processes has grown from 1 to 2. So 0 and 2, 4 and 6. At that point, we are, we are doing 256 additions. We have 256 pairs of values being added together. The next step has us add pairs of values between processes whose gaps are 4 instead. So 0 and 4, 8, yeah, 0 and 4, 8 and 12, 16 and 20, and so on. We would keep doing this, increasing the gaps by powers of 2, and each time we would be decreasing the 
number of editions being performed exponentially. The very last edition has us add values between processes 0 and 512. We are doing one edition at this point. But at that point, we will have done all the additions in about 10 steps. We had 1024 values to add. We did it in 10 steps. So it took about 1 100th of the time to add all those 1,000 some odd values. 1 100th of the time. So mathematically speaking, in general, if we're to use this tree structure for doing addition, if we have n values to be added, the time needed to add those values using a tree structure is on the order of log base 2 of n. So, given that 2 to the power of 10 is approximately 10 to the power of 3, if we had about a million terms, we, we can do this whole process of addition in about 20 steps. The challenge, of course, is programming all of this. So, if you can imagine, if I can take out my notepad here. I was making screenshots for another class, so let me just delete that. Okay, so let's consider the simple example of we have we have eight processes whose ranks are 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. The gap between processes right now is 1. So at this point, we are having processes pairs of processes separated by one, and they are adding their values together into one value that is stored by one of the other processes. If your process, if for a process the rank is an even number, you are to receive a message from the process whose rank is one higher than yours. If your rank is an odd number, you are to send a message to the process whose rank is one less than yours. And that is the rule that we are to enforce to each pair of processes here. And that's what I'm drawing right here right now. Okay, but now we've done all our additions. What's next? Well, now we have processes 2, 0, 2, 4, and 6. If your process ID, no, if your rank is an odd number, so processes, okay, I guess another way you can do this is to consider, is to consider the whole thing being recursive. So, for processes, we are going to do the next round of additions using processes 0, 2, 4, and 6. So, here's the next rule for that we do before we perform the next round of additions. Take your rank and divide it by 2. So, take your rank and divide it by 2. If your remainder is not 0, you are not involved in this next round of additions. So, 0 divided by 2 is 0, so 0 is involved. 1 divided by 2 has a remainder of 1, so 1 is not involved. 2 divided by 2 is 1. 3 divided by 2 has a remainder of 1, so process 3 is not involved. 4 divided by 2 is 2. 5 divided by 2 it has a remainder 1. 6 divided by 2 is 3, 7 divided by 2 has a remainder 1, so process 7 is not involved. Hey, it's recursive! We have this whole, whole thing again. But we only have it to do it with processes whose ranks are 0, 1, 2, and 3. Here, we are doing the same work with processes whose ranks is 0, 1, 2, and 3. But not quite. These are processes whose ranks, after being divided by 2, are 
0, 1, 2, and 3. So we play the same game as we did for these four processes, except we're doing it with these four processes. So 0 and 1, add their values together. 2 and 3, add their values together. It's recursive. So now we have to play that game of taking your rank and then dividing it by 2 again. 0 divided by 2 is still 0. 0 divided, no, 1 divided by 2 has a remainder 1. So this process, whose rank is 1 but was actually 2, will not be involved in the next step. Rank 2, 2 divided by 2 is 1. So this process is rank, which was originally rank 4, it's now 2, and now it's 1. That process will be involved in the next round of additions. 3 divided by 2 has remainder 1. This was process 6. Its rank was 6. In the second round of additions, it was divided by 2, so we got rank 3. And now we divided a by 2 again, and now it's not going to be involved in this round of additions. So now, we play that one rule one more time. If your rank is an even number, you are to receive a message from, a pro from the process whose rank is one higher than yours. If your rank is an odd number, you are to send a message to the process whose rank is one less than yours. And just like that, we've added everything, and our value, the value, the total value that we have, is now stored in process zero. We also need to make some extra considerations of what would happen if we had an eighth process, or maybe a ninth process, or a tenth process. Okay, in this example, it means processes 8 and 9 will add their values together, and it's stored in process 8. It goes through the divide by 2 rule again, so this would be process 4. Not really, but we need to divide these things by 2 to make the math work. Uh, process 10 does not have a companion process 11. So it does nothing, and it just proceeds to the next step. So this is now, let's call it process 5. Process 5 in the next step, at least. And then these two process, processes would then add their values. And now this is process 2. It means now we have an extra process 1, so we need to do that step of addition once more. So yeah, extra considerations is needed for when we have a quantity of processes that isn't a power of 2. But that's how we would do it. So is this something I would ask for you to do? Actually, no. It is something for you to think about, but the thing about OpenMP and MPI as well, there are constructs in both of those that make it so that we can program parallel programs using as little code as possible. This gets me into the next part of our discussion, and that is the MPI reduce function. MPI has a few implementations to make it easy, easier to calculate global sums. What we were doing up until now was point-to-point -point communications, where one process talks to another process, basically. What we're doing is point-to-point -point communications, but it's one process communicating with all other processes on the same communicator. Collective communication is what it's called. Let's check that. Let's check out this MPI reduce thing here. So a reduction operation is where you have multiple values across multiple processes and you have to total up all of those values into one single variable. No, you have to total all those 
values into one value stored in one variable stored on one process. That is what a reduction is for our purposes. Thing is, um, addition is not the only reduction operation that we can do in MPI. But we are looking at addition as our main example in the trapezoid program. So let's just say our reduction operation is addition, because it is. Just keep in mind that we have a lot more options than just addition. So, MPI generalizes the notion of a global sum by using a single function called MPI reduce. So it means we need to tell this reduce function here, hey, we're doing addition here. So there are seven arguments to be passed into this function. The first argument is the address of the local value to be added. The second argument is the address of the total. The third argument is, well, we'll set that to one. We'll get that back to that later. Just set it to one for now. If we're adding singular values between processes, just add we're adding one value to one other value, set that count to one for now, I'll get into what it means to have a count that is greater than one. The fourth argument is the data type. We talked about data types. We need, whenever we send messages, we need to specify a data type. The fifth argument is, what is the reduction operation that we're performing? This is back on the previous table, so. The sixth process, no, the sixth argument is what is the destination process? Which process ha is going to have the total? And the seventh process, is, no, and the seventh argument is what's the communicator? So remember that block of code from the trapezoid rule where processes are seen, sending their values to process zero? It means with the knowledge of the reduction op function now, we can replace all that code with one line of code. Isn't that neat? Yeah, we went through all this process, we went through all this trouble of defining all of these, um, all these blocks of code where we would be doing one step after another and then coordinating it with some other process. We did that just to establish a baseline of what these programs are doing. When we are programming MPI programs meant to be scalable, we don't we probably don't want to do this. Not for the sake of efficiency, but for the sake of saving our fingers. My point is we have all these we have all of this code. We don't have to type it all out anymore. All we gotta do is write one line of code. And that's it. Let's go back to that third argument in that reduce function. If we are adding singular values between, if we're adding single values between processes, we can just set that count to one. The point of having a count that is greater than one is so we can do reduction operators, reduction operations on entire vectors, or I should say, arrays. For example, we can do vector vector ad addition. Say we have x y coordinates between multiple processes processes and we need to add all of them together. If we are doing that, we would need to set the count not to 1, but if we're doing x y values that's two values, we need a count of 2. In general, we can do this with any array of size n. So we would need to set that count, that third argument, to n. So that's what that count is for. Think about what that means for your, mid, for your final project, by the way. So here are a couple of key differences between com collective communication and point-to-point -point communication. One. All processes, all the processes in the communicator must call the same collective function. Trying to call MPI reduce on one process while calling MPI receive on another is erroneous and it might crash the program. Number two, 
the arguments passed by each process to collective communication must be compatible. If one process has the destination process B0 and another process somehow has the destination process B1, the program will crash. Number three, that second argument in the MPI reduce function, that is only ever used by the destination processor. That's only ever used by the destination process. All processes still need to pass something to that. All processes still need to pass in that second argument, even if it's null. That's number three. Number four, point to point communications are matched based on the tag and the communicator. Collective communications, however, don't use tags. Instead, they're matched by the communicator and the order in which they're called. We're not really working with tags here, but just in case you are, keep in mind that nowhere in this reduce function do we see a parameter that is our tag. So we can't match it by tag, we gotta match it by order. So if the first reduce, if the first call reduce is meant for tag one, and then the second instance of calling reduce is meant for tag zero. That's how we would disambiguate uh, reduction operations by tag. We can't do it by tag, we have to do it by order. One final caveat. Using the same buffer for the input and output is considered illegal in MPI. The results are unpredictable and it might crash the program. It's illegal due to conventions because in Fortran, because MPI is made, made to work on both C and Fortran. In Fortran, there's this concept called aliasing where the input and output arguments are referring to, to the same block of memory. Fortran prohibits that. So that's why if we have something like this, MPI reduce address of X for the first argument, address of X for the second argument. We can't, we don't do that here. We can't do that here. Right. Now we know how to do a reduction operation. But what if, okay, now we have our main, we have a total value, but what if all the processes need that value as part of another computation? So think about it. We need, we talked about how we can set up this tree structure, but if we need to send this value out to all other processes. We gotta do this tree structure in reverse. So we're doing a reduction operation followed by sending out this value to all other processes. We can do this reduction in a tree structure, or we can have MPI reduce do that for us. But does it mean we have to code in a way of doing the reverse tree structure here? This topology is sometimes known as a butterfly for, well, obvious reasons. It looks like a butterfly, doesn't it? Well, MPI also has another trick up its sleeve. It's called MPI All Reduce. It's a variant of reduce, except the total value is not given to one process. It's given to all processes. So we have six arguments here X instead of seven. What's missing is we do not have a destination process anymore. So instead of one process being designated as the destination where that process receives the total value, all processes receive that total value. Okay, so there's one more here. We did a reduce operation, which was this half of the butterfly. We did a all reduce operation, which is the whole butterfly. What if we wanted this part of the butterfly? This is called a broadcast, and it is when we have one process sending out a message to all other processes on the communicator. So here's the code for that. This is another function, it's MPI bcast. It has 
five arguments. The arguments are the same as the arguments here are the same as that with MPI reduce, except we don't have a destination process. We have a source process. One process sends a message to all other processes within the same communicator. So let's go back to that reduce function from before. There were seven arguments to be passed into MPI reduce. One of them was the reduction operator that we had to do. The other one was the output data pointer. That's the second argument. That's the address of the total. If we are doing a broadcast, we don't we don't deal with output data p and we don't deal with operator. We're not doing reduction, we're just broadcasting a message to everyone. We're pinging everyone on a Discord server by saying at everyone. We also don't have a destination process anymore. As I said, we have a source process. So there is one process that is typing at everyone to everyone in the communicator. So that's why the MPI bcast function only has five arguments to be passed in. Data pointer, count, data type, source process, and communicator. And that's it. So it means Remember this get input function that I talked about earlier? We had a situation where one process is receiving values that it's sending to all other processes. It means we can simplify that code by having this. Process zero receives user input and then it ca calls broadcast on those three entered values. So we don't need this if, else, and for loop here anymore. That's why it's commented out here. I can tell you right now that if you're to swap all the code, if you're to replace this code here with this broadcast code, and if you are to swap all this code with this reduce code, in the trapezoid program, it will work the same way. The difference is we are doing the same thing with less code. And, it, and isn't that neat? Now, I wish I had more slides talking about the next couple things. Um, give me a bit. Everything we were talking about thus far was from a couple sections in the textbook. Um, 3.4 Point one, three point four point two, three point four point three, three point four point four, three point four point five. The next section that I wanted to get to was three point four point six, three point four point seven, and three point four point eight, and maybe three point four point nine. So maybe in the meantime, I would just instead advise you to read through those sections, and then we can talk about, and then I can explain more about it next week. So this video is a little bit on the short side because I have something upcoming that I need to get to that will require me to be out of town again. But maybe I can take this time to address uh, your upcoming homework assignment. So you have a homework assignment in which you are to... Let me find it. This is for sections 1 and 60. You have a homework assignment in which you are to... Yeah, here we are. You have a homework assignment in which you ha are to... Try the pi calculation programs from chapter 4 with busy waiting and mutex and see how bad it is to use busy waiting over a mutex.
So, I decided to push back that due date by about by a few more days, so I believe I had it set to be due on November 15th instead. So, what I've done is, if we look at here, this is for both sections 1 and section 60, by the way. Under the modules here, we have the pthread pi calculation program. What I want you to do is if I can load. Well, here we are. Okay, so for assignment two, you are to take this code here. Uh, and then you're going to modify the thread sum function here. You are to add in the code additions from PowerPoint slides 4C and 4D. 4C is the one about busy waiting, 4D is the one about mutexes. I want you to run this program on some large number of threads, maybe 8 or 16, 8, 12, or 16 is okay. Run it on a large number of threads, and then also run it for a large number of terms. So this is the number n in the program. Set that to a large number, maybe 1 million, maybe 10 million. The point is, we want to get, you want to demonstrate the program stalling because of how busy waiting makes all the threads do work that isn't productive. Also, since we went through all the process, since we went through all the work of getting our midterm projects print out an execution time, you can refer to the code that I gave you regarding the midterm on how to get execution times to add code to this program to get you an execution time. So for example, if we could do something like this, I'm going to copy paste, or at least I'm going to try to copy paste all this code. Um, copy paste all this code, we can for example paste it in here. I need to type in a few more lines. That was a curly bracket and turn null. Really the main part of the program is what we're measuring the, in the program is how long it takes for the program to go from the beginning of the main function to the end. However, when we do that, and let me just pull up the slides real quick. All right, so here we can, for example, we need to add in time.h. So let me just write that in. Time.h, put that on somewhere in the top. Then you would write in clock underscore t begin equals clock. We put that at the beginning, towards the end, and right before, uh, right after we've done three thread handles, we would type in clock t n equals clock. And then I would call some, and then I would do something like this print f the program took percent f seconds to run backslash n and then time spent I would save that I can't build it because this is just going to throw an error in Visual Studio 
So that's how we would modify the ptreads program to print an execution time. The next step is to look into those two sets of PowerPoint slides where we change the code so it includes a busy waiting and then modify the yeah modify the program so it includes busy waiting get an execution time for some number of threads and terms change the code again so that it uses mutex locks run the program again on the same number of threads and terms and then report the execution times since this is a rather short assignment all you really need to do well the least you can do is to just because I'm already because I'm giving you all the code already all you really got to do the, the least you can do as a submission is just put a screenshot of the two programs running and they both have execution times attached to them as their output I should say so that's what you got to do for this next assignment modify the p threads program here so that it uses um, either a mutex lock or a busy waiting and then get the execution time this is the C way of getting an execution time you can also do it the C++ way so that's what you got to do for this next assignment if you have any questions you are always welcome to message me about it and although it's never really mentioned in the syllabus you can request a zoom meeting with me if you need to we just gotta set up a good time for that all right so that's for programming assignment two i would also like to add address the short answer question which was due yesterday what did we do with that well here's what we did on line 19 this was supposed to be stir len greeting plus one if we run if we build that and try to run it i'm going to try to run it right now i'm going to open in file explorer windows over here debug mpi.exe i'm going to type in powershell into the address bar and i'm going to type in that mpi exec command that will run the program mpi fall 2023.exe mpi exec dash n four and then the name of the executable if i type that in i get greetings from processes 0 of 4 1 of 4 2 of 4 and 3 of 4 so it works so here's what happens if we take out that plus one build that run the program again hey there's random garbage at the end what's up with that so here's the thing this greeting is a character array that is storing an incoming message from one of the processes one of the processes is calling send and it is sending its greeting which is actually this when in C you have strings and those strings are terminated by what's called a null character or I should say a null terminator that character denotes the end of a string so if you are to read this string one by one characters are text like this isn't really text it's rather numeric values that represent the text so you would have the program read this message one character at a time reading byte by byte and if it sees a zero that it means hey i reached the end of the message i'm not gonna print any more of the message however this message is going to be stored in here and there is space for a message that is up to 100 characters long obviously this thing is less than 100 characters long and that's why we are getting random garbage like this so that message is less than 100 characters we are 
basically printing out the entirety of the greeting, or I should say, the entirety of the character array. Because we never told the program where to stop reading the message. So that's why we're getting all of these random characters. We forgot the adult terminator, we are printing out random garbage. Where does this random garbage come from? It comes from whatever values were already in memory. Okay, so that's what happens if we type in sterling greeting without the plus one. If I type in max string, rebuild that. Max string is the maximum size that we specified for this greeting here. This character array is storing our greeting and we gave it a maximum size of 100 characters. So what happens if in the send function I have max string instead? I build that. I run the program again. Hey, nothing happened. So here's the other thing. Our message is null terminated, but we are sending characters after that. As so, what happens is. MPI send is going to send this greeting here. It's going to send this message here, but it's also going to send all the other characters that was already in this character array as part of the message. Because the message is properly null terminated, it means the receiving process is going to print this message out character by character and then stop at the null character. What we did is, if you think about it, in a way, we ended up sending a package in a box that is larger than it needs to be. So that's what ha happened here. We tried, we sent a message that is larger than it needs to be. We sent it with additional random characters that we didn't need to send with it. So that is what's happening when we try to replace the second argument with max string and sterling greeting without the plus one. When it's supposed to be sterling greeting plus one, and that plus one is to make room for a null terminator. That way, when process zero receives a message, it knows where the message ends. All right, so that's gonna be it for this week. I would love to get into, next, into the next part of MPI because at that point we might just have enough information to work on our final project. Alright, um, work on the assignment because I pushed back the due date. If you did not submit short answer question 3 yet, um, the late policy applies so you can submit it up to one week late without any penalty. This also applies for the programming assignment too, in case you are, you really need, in case you're really having trouble with getting the assignment to work. So anyway, I'd like you to play around with the, I'd l I would like you to play with the, not just the Petrex program, I'd also like you to play with the code for the trapezoidal rule in MPI because all this code that we have here, we can simplify it by replacing this with one line of code and all this with one line of code per message. So yeah, we have the reduce function and what it does to us is reduce the amount of code we need to write. Alright, so maybe I'll talk about what we are to do for our midterm project in the coming uh, in the coming discussion because we're at week 11 right now. It's almost the end of the semester. So there's really the matter of your final project as your 
next big main assignment. All right, that's probably gonna be it. That's gonna be it from me for this week. Um, finish up the assignment, uh, play with the code, read through the rest of section 3.4 in the textbook. This is, as I said, we were looking at section 3.4 in the textbook, which was collective communication, 3.1, 3.2, 3.3, 3.4, 3.3, 3.4, and 3.5 we already looked at. I want you to look at 3.4. I misspoke it. I miss. I said wrong the section numbers. What I'm saying is, uh, quickly read through sections 3.4.6, 3.4.7, 3.4.8, and 3.4.9. And that's going to be the next section we're going to be looking at for MPI in the textbook. All right? Have a good week. Have a good weekend. And then we'll pick up next week. All right? Thank you.